the Deputy Director of the Monash Research Centre and Blair is here with me. We're going to share this talk, um, go half and half. Um, hopefully it won't be too much disruption changing over. We just need to start over. Uh, oh, you record it? Yeah, okay. just start an introduction again. Sorry. Okay. We're going to start again. <laughs> Okay, hi all, uh, welcome. Um, um, my name is Steve Quinnett, Deputy Director of the Monash Air Research Centre, and Blair and I, uh, who's also part of my team, are gonna give this talk today. Uh, we're talking about um, our view on how um, we help researchers using the cloud, HPC, and all these things put together. We're gonna use slightly different words, and um, I'm gonna spend um, the first 10 minutes of this talk actually explaining what those words uh, mean to us and that framework of thinking and, and how that drives what we do and how we do it. Um, there's a third member to this team, Wojciech, uh, who is not here today with us, um, and uh, we'll look, you'll see his bits uh, influence in this work as well. Um, so our equipment and our work, uh, everything we do is full of HPC-like things. It's got RDMA, we've got GPUs, we've got lots of cores, parallel file systems, and all these sorts of things, but I don't think what we do is HPC. Um, and I say that painting you know, with a lot of pain because I come from a HPC background, right? And, and you know, uh, part of this thing is how do we start thinking about it in a slightly different way that um, lets us really move forward and, and influence the world. Um, but to, to begin with, I'll, I'll start off with how we used to talk about this five years ago because we've even changed since then. Um, and we used to five years ago, and there's two points here, we used to talk about the peak and long tail. We used to sort of say the peak were the HPC guys and the long tail were the guys doing stuff on window shares, right? And you usually supported one or two camps. And as a result, there was this pit in the middle of, un, of people who weren't serviced at all, right? The, sort of the guys missing in the middle. But if we kind of look at it today, what we kind of see and we understand, and you'll see this will come through in this talk, is that the peak are more like the leading researchers and they build the tools that other researchers use, right? They, they get proliferated, right? Um, but then there's another conundrum there because the peak researchers in that tool set that they create are using tools that other researchers used, right? So even the peak are kind of long tail, right? So we, we don't really talk about peak and long tail so much anymore um, and we definitely don't associate peak with the idea of traditional HPC. Um, the other thing we did um, is we used to talk about when we were engaging researchers um, uh, and, and how we do our infrastructure uh, in, in the way that Gartner used to talk about the, the hype cycle. So um, in the early phase, it's all, um, it's all iterative and all experimental. Uh, and at the very end of the phase, it's this discipline engine room, which you give to the IT guys. And we tried that. We actually tried really hard to, um, kind of make this spectrum work and think that we could hand it over to IT guys or even HPC centers for that matter um, and expect that they could uh, do the right things. Uh, what was really interesting in the keynotes we had on Monday morning from Gartner itself, um, despite five years going on, they are still uh, using um, uh, this sort of framework of thinking. And they call you know, the early part now, this mode one, uh, I guess um, business people don't like all extra words and so they went with something simple, mode one. Um, and, and the um, discipline engine room, oh sorry, the other way around, um, mode one is the discipline engine room, the stuff we give to IT people. Uh, and, and the ex highly experimental part, which is a result of the use of the clouds and things today um, as, as, mode, as, as the uh, mode two. But even still, um, in that presentation, they recognize there's this third layer in between, and it's more like a spectrum, how you move in between, you know. And, and even more so, um, she made the point of saying that actually our IT infrastructure across the board is, is moving towards um, uh, the more cloud style of things. All right. So today, what we say instead, and this is how we think and communicate and what we do, we actually say that researchers build and use 21st century microscopes. And I'm gonna just explain to you what that means. So if we think um, of the humble microscope, it kind of came into being around 200 odd years ago. At that point, we, as in mankind, learnt how to machine brass really well. We learnt how to machine um, lenses really well and reliably. And someone had the insight, um, I guess he was sick of getting a microscope and trying to get the distance right. 
Uh, sorry, um, a little um, yeah, microscope. Um, uh, handheld one, uh, and um, uh, and so we built a little machine that joined it together using brass. Right, this was this created the biology um, biology um, discipline and research, and there was a, a, a boom of scientific outputs that resulted of that uh, as a result as a result of that. Um, you know, a microscope has a light source, which then uh, you put some sample in, and um, we have knobs and filters where light passes through this thing and through the um, uh, knobs and filters, we're able to tune uh, the device to help us see things that we couldn't see before, right? Uh, and then we have a lens, obviously, by which we can see, uh, uh, drive that process. Now, I'm going to relate this to uh, Tony Hayes um, fourth paradigm, so to speak, and, and, and um, I'm going to map it to a slightly mathematical viewpoint because, once again, computational science, HPC, whatever else, I really struggle on subjective um, conversations, right? So the microscope back then really produced just outputs. There were whys, there were observations, right? And the boom of research we had, or the first paradigm, came from those microscopes. Around the same time, we had a boom of theoretical models. In this, this case, we had Fs, you know, the models were the bits that where we were having these innovations. We actually worked out that um, statistics and normals are actually a model. And, by that, we can make various predictions and everything else. We have Newton, we have everything else, right? So uh, I'm going to come back to this in a tick, but um, one of the questions we're going to ask ourselves then is, is discovery leading technology or is it the other way around that technology is leaving discovery or is it a perpetual cycle between the two and where are we and how do we use this to drive us? Um, and if we ask that question, then it becomes very useful to ask ourselves how and what technologies have been driving mankind, right? So we know that one of the greatest technology uh, evolutions we had was the Industrial Revolution, where we um, basically over a hundred year period, we um, started to produce more food than, uh, than, than we had humans to consume, right? It was the first time in mankind we actually had more food than then, then, um, so we, we, we uh, stopped controlling our population growth by starvation, essentially, right? Um, and that was a 5% growth compounded over, uh, every year, uh, compounded over te about 100 years. Uh, I, haven't left, I haven't put that in this graph, but um, I've taken the electronic ones out here. Uh, the real interesting one is the red line, which is the speed at which we traveled across the uh, Atlantic, right? And we went from steam liners to basically Boeings with um, um, jet um, things in the 1950s, right? And during that, you know, sort of 40, 50 year period of that innovation boom, and uh, 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 we, we you know, flight was, um, uh, air flight was, was, was special. Um, you know, it was all this, you know, uh, there was this boom of culture around air flight and everything else, and a lot of industry uh, was bought. But it, it, we never, we didn't, we hit 1950 and we actually stopped going across the Atlantic any faster at about 500 um, kilometres an hour, or whatever it is. You look at the, uh, what's happened 40 years after that, um, the US government had to help its airlines because the innovation was lost and the business models around everything had changed, right? So it's interesting to see these things. Um, now, for everyone in this room, we all know what this blue line is going to be without me having to say it, right? It's essentially Moore's law, right? Um, it is nothing, is, nothing else is like it in mankind's history, and it's 50% compounded growth over a 50 year period. Um, sure, it's sort of maybe stagnated a little bit now, um, but it's not clear that something like it won't continue for a period of time yet. The real interesting question actually is how has that influenced what we do in science and research? Um, if we take our fourth paradigm model, what it really means is at some point, we actually could start using computers to deal with the fact that our Fs, our models, are big and complicated, much bigger than what the human mind could do. As a result of this, we have in engineering, we have CFDs, predictions, and all these things that we do through, uh, and all these discoveries we've made through, if you like, the third paradigm of computing or simulation. Right. I can add to the graph and say, well, um, the green line is essentially the uh, size of the most expensive hard disk you can buy. So it's like the peak of hard disks. Um, 
and the little green, uh, uh, yellow line is uh, the growth of our sensory, sensor capabilities. Now these two together, you can then argue, have driven the fourth paradigm, which is around data. In this case, data, the why is really, really big, right? And that's, sort of, that's the idea. But the fourth paradigm is really, you can probably break it down into three different ways. It's data mining, and in which case, um, the big why, what we're trying to do is actually find what the F and X are. We're trying to find what the knowledge is. There, there is no, we don't give it any prior knowledge in, in, in uh, 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 models, right? And there's data assimilation where we already have big and complicated models and we have the big data we've observed. And we're trying to marry or, or s uh, work out some equivalence between the two. Um, Visualisation is still immensely uh, relevant because if it was true that you could data mine everything, then we wouldn't need to do research whatsoever. Right? Um, and the best lens we can actually have is going to be environments that give us, let us see the most. And we have a, a facility in particular that um, uh, the amount of pixels and the brightness of those pixels we can see in these facilities allow us uh, researchers to help discover things that they um, then put into models or help condition data mining from that point on. Um, and I've, I've added this because it's really relevant to this meeting. Um, and we've heard a lot about the Internet of Things, and, and I'm sort of sort of suggesting here that maybe there is a fifth paradigm, perhaps, because I don't think it's really about the fourth. And we're seeing it in how big businesses are thinking about where the future is. And that is that this orange line is the number of devices on the Internet or the uh, Internet of Things, um, and it's predicted to be the only thing that will continue at something that looks like Moore's Law, right? Now, the real question is, how is that influencing how business works? Well, think about 10 years ago, five years ago even, you went on a Windows machine, you had your email pop up, and it was made by your institution, right? Now, your email is probably done by Google, your uh, Verizon or something might be who provides your telecommunications, and there's, there's several companies involved in, part in doing the thing that you used to do by yourself before. Um, so because of these curves, we can kind of see that the world is changing, changing. And to win, for our researchers, we need to think about what is that workshop and what are the materials that allows them to uh, play in the space and, and win. So we say that the 21st century microscope looks more like something that ties together the big instruments and all the things that produce this raw data, the supercomputers and cloud infrastructures and the softwares on them that are the filters and allow us to tune to see the things we couldn't see before. And rather than light going up this thing, it's data and it transforms as it goes up through this thing. Uh, and then lens then is really the environment we interact with. They are now desktops and other things like that. Um, so our facility um, aims to create that environment where we can, the br it becomes the brass or the ability to make and tune that brass. Uh, we use OpenStack and Ceph and, and, and um, Blair will continue talking about these bits in a little bit. Um, and it has a lot of, it was always from day one part of a, a federation to share and collaborate across Australia, the Nectar Research Cloud. We have Lyle in the room here. And it was always from day one about specialist equipment. We had no intent of trying to compete with Amazon if you like, if it was just about dollars per core or cloud bursting, right? The intent here was bringing the right equipment for our researchers uh, to do what they need to do. Um, so we had Rocky, SSDs, high memory, all these things from day one. Um, the graph on the right is the number of core hours allocated per month. Um, and, and it's been a, literally a sort of exponential kind of curve and how, uh, how it's grown over the, since we started, which is not that long ago. Which brings us on to what is HPC as a service for us, or what is HPC and the cloud. If Rackmon is the bit that lets us orchestrate our 21st century microscopes, then the HPC part is really just another flavor. It's just another part, a component, that other people connect into the bigger things they're doing. Right? So we're not really HPC first. We don't think in a HPC first type of way. Um, and so, and, and the point here is then that actually what we're focusing on is the environments those researchers are trying to connect everything with. Um, and I'm going to give you two end members as two examples. 
And one is we had um, Australia's banks uh, are actually quite powerful. They're really well, well in our ground renowned businesses. I guess it means they rip us off a lot. I don't know. Um, the, uh, and, and we did some world first research where basically the bank and the, uh, and the researcher said that they want to do some data mining on some real EFPOS data, electronic transfer data. Um, uh, so it's, it's highly confidential, highly sensitive. They were trying to discover or think about whether they were categorizing their marketplace well. Um, the data mining required machinery, which was not normal. We were able to very quickly create a virtual environment uh, and uh, uh, its, its own microscope. We were able to destroy that environment afterwards, do all the secure stuff. Uh, yes, we didn't have software-defined networking doing, for, doing it for us like at that time, uh, but we, we weren't that far. Right? So the, the concept is there. Is that HPC? Whatever it is, it was really, really important. They were able to publicly say that uh, this was the world first, and they knew that only in the entire world, only two US banks were going to be even close to be able to do something similar. I don't know if they have by yet, but I imagine they probably have, um, which is quite significant, right? But maybe something that's a bit more normal. Um, the study of perforin is a protein that is used to, that's in your um, cells that actually allows things to come in your cells. They open and close and form whatever else. Um, and it's one of those tricky things. I was talking to Paul about this yesterday. It's one of those tricky ones where, like most of these um, uh, things we're trying to understand, where we can't crystallize it easily. So we can't just throw them in a synchrotron really easy. Uh, and we need to see things at the scale which are beyond um, uh, what we can do with the synchrotrons. And so there's new equipment coming about, new microscopes being built or instruments for those microscopes. And they require computation to get us to the point of being able to see things, right? Um, it very much is that data assimilation problem. Um, and so the environment looks a little bit like this. We've got some instruments. It has to go to HPC and it has to be shared and stuff for later use for com common things. And everything in this circle is about how do we produce uh, an accelerated, reproducible environment for, 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 for making this happen. And what they're trying to do, and this is out of, directly out of their nature paper, um, um, is this is the statement around the set of tools they use and how the pipeline will work. So this is the bit that we need to reproduce for other people for the proliferation part, but it's also the bit we need to make easy for them to make for the, you know, uh, in, the, in the first part. Um, so we created this thing called the Characterization Virtual Laboratory. It's essentially a managed desktop environment. It's VDI, right? But it's already connected to all the HPC equipment and all the data sources in the secure or appropriate ways, if you like. Um, and it's also this sort of mass customization thing where we have a core way that we do it, and there are certain flavors of these for the various disciplines that are pushing the boundaries. Uh, we have four major ones in, in Australia. The, these are national projects. Um, and, and, um, and they're listed, they're listed here. Um, now, why is this important? Because if I go back to that very first graph, it tackles that middle gap. And our usage pattern for this is an exponential curve. These are the number of people who actively use it. So they're not accounts, they're actual active users. And on the right hand side is um, the number of times those, uh, a subset of those people are using it. And you'll, you'll see there, there are 60 people who have used it more than 100 times, have actively used the sessions or whatever more than 100 times. Which is kind of scary when you think about the stats of, and how we try and measure stats of HPC facilities nowadays. Right? Well, one last part about this is, um, we give the researchers a, a little, little app, um, which gives them a one click to get them onto the virtual laboratory. Um, and the virtual laboratory really takes the form of a bunch of um, GPU enabled um, you know, VDIs, um, which is amazingly managed through Slurm. You know, so we use a HPC style QManage to manage that resource. Um, and everything then happens through the web and even the VDI connections. Right? So that's sort of the pattern. Um, my, but the last thing I'll say before I hand over to Blair is we want to join those two paradigms together. What we're doing with the characterization virtual lab in accelerating the peak researchers and the proliferation of those, uh, that, of that sort of work with um, security. And, and this is important to us because we have a lot of medical 
um, applications coming into being. So if we apply this same problem, the imaging, to matching that to phenotype data, or if it's genomics matching it to phenotype data, we have a problem where we can't take the data off that environment until the governance of that project or the data says it's okay. And so we're, um, uh, we, 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 we're in this phase where we're starting to have to marry these sorts of things. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Blair. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about, um, I guess, what makes that that engine room of the uh, virtual microscope tick, and some of the prehistory there with the Nectar Research Cloud program, because that's really worth mentioning. Um, Nectar uh, was a you know pretty pioneering program at the time, so that was uh, established by the federal government, Super Science Initiative. Uh, in 2011, there was a small technical committee set up uh, to advise on what cloud middleware we should use in the Nectar Research Cloud. Um, I was fortunate to be on that committee, only by mistake really. I'd been doing a bit of stuff on Amazon and not many people had at the time really. Um, I was working in a research group and sort of got pulled out of that and everything snowballed from there. Um, Tom Fifield, who a uh, few people may recognise his name, now Tom at OpenStack.org, um, he acted as a consultant uh, into that group and did an evaluation of feature set and stuff across the different options at the time. Um, and keep in mind that that was approximately the Bexar timeframe for OpenStack. So, you know, one of the highlights in the release notes for Swift in that release was uh, experimental S3 support, API support. Um, but the decision that we ended up making or recommending in that committee was actually largely not to do with tech at all. It was more about the community process and the governance structure that was starting to spring up around OpenStack. It looked very promising. And uh, you know, ultimately, I think we made a good decision. So then, uh, so Uni University of Melbourne, uh, also in Melbourne uh, as Monash's, uh, was the lead agent or is the lead agent for the Nectar program. They established the first node, the pilot node for Nectar, um, which opened up to, to users in January 2012. Um, so I guess that would have been deployed on Diablo, I think. Um, Monash, our node, we eventually joined following in early 2013. Um, and we've sort of had this just-in-time features coming into Nova to actually allow our, our architecture there for the Nectar Research Cloud. So we were one of the first Nova cell, like first major Nova cells deployments outside of Rackspace. Um, and now there's eight nodes across Australia with over 10 data centres and 30,000 cores. And uh, those 30,000 cores actually are, that's just the, the cores that the Nectar program itself funded to be built for public access. It's worth noting that many of the nodes now, including Monash, are adding a bunch of capacity and they're leveraging that infrastructure, but for their own institutional investment or their members. Um, the, other, the other thing to point out is about the cells infrastructure because that's, sort of, that's kind of a new thing in OpenStack for many people now, um, whereas we've been doing it for a long time. And I was actually, I was kind of skeptical about that to begin with, I have to admit, because having been a user of Amazon, I was used to the regions idea and I had done, you know, programmed against that and I thought, oh, well, that seems fine. But actually, it really significantly makes things easier for the end user. You know, they have... At the time, there was no support for regions in Horizon. Um, the way we have things set up, users just come to the one dashboard, they have the same identity everywhere, and you know we don't have issues of trying to sync Keystone and this sort of thing. They just have a drop-down list of AZs that they can use, and they don't even have to pick one if they don't want to. The other big advantage is that we have a core services group that look after all the user-facing stuff, the APIs and all of that, and the core, that core infrastructure. And down at the nodes, we worry about the compute infrastructure and that sort of thing. So we kind of have a smaller management footprint. So uh, RACMON, which is sort of this funny abbreviation mix of its just research cloud Monash, um, is now about uh, 210 compute nodes across two data centers, um, about 6,500 CPU cores, um, 45 terabytes of RAM, 
that 150 GPUs and volume Ceph and a bit of luster as well. There's maybe about um, 1.5 petabytes of that is luster. The rest is Ceph. Um, all integrated into the cloud infrastructure. So HPC at Monash, we've had a HPC resource for quite a while. It started out as the, uh, the Monash Sun grid, I think, and then sort of became the Monash campus cluster. Uh, it's a typical institutional HPC, services everybody and everything, PhD students, high-end star researchers, that sort of thing. Uh, for a long while, we've had a sort of a partner share model where those people that have gotten grants to buy infrastructure, we'll take that, bring it in, manage it through the cluster, and then also Monash will provide some of the operational expense there too. Uh, and that's, that's really good because, I, I mean, I, I talk to people in HPC forums and the problem of, you know, little departmental clusters everywhere and I, I talked to one guy last week who was managing 17 clusters. It's <laughs> amazing, right? Um, and then, and so that's now called, we recently changed the name of that when we uh, sort of moved things onto the cloud, so that's now called Monarch. Um, and Monarch sort of, if you like, the uh, one, maybe one step ahead of Massive, which is the next resource, where Monarch, we maybe in a, we're innovating a little bit more at the middleware layer, and then Massive is coming along and taking that and doing that at a larger scale as well. Uh, so Massive is, is actually another uh, federally funded project. Um, it's, Australia has a national computational infrastructure. It's a shoulder, shoulder facility of that infrastructure specialising in characterisation, so imaging and visualisation, and with a number of external partners and, and affiliates as well. For example, the Australian Synchrotron, which is co-located with Monash in Melbourne. Uh, so Monarch now is run almost entirely on OpenStack. Um, so all of our compute infrastructure there is running in a hypervisor, Ubuntu KVM. Uh, what we did initially was actually just take an existing Nova cell that we had for the Nectar Research Cloud and add to it, build it out, uh, and just use host aggregates to control things so that the, uh, the cluster project could get to those nodes. We also went into Lustre for the first time. Previously, we just had sort of NFS filers and this sort of thing attached to HSM, and we had all sorts of nasty things happening, like users trying to run HPC jobs on a hierarchical storage file system and wondering why things were getting pushed out to tape. Um, that, that resource is just all dual socket has well gear, a mix of high core and high speed stuff for various workloads. Uh, by and large, though, we see in terms of job numbers, probably still over 80% single-threaded workload. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head what that looks like in terms of the actual CPU time spent on the resource. Um, but we are starting now to see, compared to, say, five years ago, an increase in the number of parallel jobs and people doing sort of a bit of starting to dabble in OpenMP and this sort of thing just within a node or hybrid stuff where they're going across two to eight nodes, this sort of thing. Um, and initially, because we built this as part of the Nectar Research Cloud, one of our architectural constraints there was to fit within the framework, the OpenStack framework that we were using at the time. And we were still on Nova Network then. Um, this was a year ago, I guess. Um, and using multi-host flat DHCP, but we wanted to integrate with Lustre. So that, that proved to be a small challenge. However, not entirely impossible to overcome. Um, so I guess people sort of want to know why, why do HPC on OpenStack? Um, well, for us, it was about consolidation on, on the one hand, um, our HPC team then becomes, I guess, sort of you know, a customer of my team. Um, and those guys also can really focus just on their operations. They're not too worried about hardware anymore. In fact, we're not really that worried about hardware either in my team. Um, flexibility, of course, is another big one. Lots of people that are running standard HPC facilities, especially with CentOS and that sort of thing, they typically say they've got bioinformaticians who want Ubuntu. Uh, seems to be a common pattern. 
and we get Windows users coming along as well, various software requirements. And we had some confidence there too, because uh, from the very beginning, when we started running in the Nectar Research Cloud, the HPC team, you know, they already had a resource of a whole lot of mixed and old hardware running on bare metal. And at that point, they started spreading out onto our local cloud resource as well. And so, you know, we already had a fair bit of confidence that that was actually going to work and be suitable for our workloads. Um, and so why not bare metal or ironic? Well, so sort of like I'm saying, the performance for us was good enough. So we didn't really feel like it was worth trying to learn how to do ironic as well when we already had this big file of KVM infrastructure. Uh, and w I mean, I'm sort of basically the only OpenStack architect in the team and I haven't really gotten confident enough yet that with ironic you can achieve the like the provisioning network isolation and that sort of thing to get secure multi-tenancy and, and that that secure multi-tenancy is something that we're that we really are after because whilst we tend to build these HPC facilities as something that's going to be a managed service at the end of the day for the user we still want that flexibility there to be able to to be able to hand a chunk off to a user if they really need it so and uh, also worth mentioning that the bare metal was one of the uh, one of the big to topics that the science working group folks uh, identified as wanting more information about and some work on. So how are we doing for time, Sue? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we've got like five minutes, have we? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is like a little basic diagram of how Monarch is run on OpenStack. Um, above the line is OpenStack, below the line is bare metal, so Lustre is the only bare metal piece in there. Um, with Nova Network, we solved the problem of integrating with Lustre there by simply using PCI pass-through. Uh, so we, we use Malinox gear there. Their NICs fortunately allow you to do some funky things with PCI virtual functions. So you can do things like define virtual functions that are already tied to a VLAN, this sort of thing. So then when, a, when an instance starts up on one of these nodes, it's got whatever the Nova Network interface was, so it has, say, a public IP or a private IP, depending on how you set up, um, that's provided by Nova Network and DHCP, and then they actually go and configure their Layer 3 services using the Layer 2 device that we've given them. So they set up their own private subnet, um, obviously, so they can talk to Lustre as well. Um, so that's been, Monarch has now been in production for six months. Um, they started from scratch there, so it was an entirely new cluster didn't bring the other users across. So in six months, there's 150 total users, 50 active, and they've done about 800,000 jobs in that time. Uh, a number of different, different types of workload and domains you can see probably, uh, probably resonates with people who, who have institutional facilities. Um, so some of, the, some of the issues with virtualized HPC, um, I mean, it's, it's not all uh, beer and Skittles. Um, there are some points of confusion, I guess, uh, with regard to performance tuning and so forth. Um, CERN have been a big community player that have done a lot of work and shared really well in this space. Um, and if you want to know, like, get into details about this stuff, I'm not going to go into low level here, because well, one thing we don't have time, and this is a beginner talk, but really go and have a look at their blog. Um, Hypervisor features are one of the issues. I mean, there's a bunch of features that are great for general virtualization workloads. That this is basically stuff that Linux does. So kernel same page merging can save your memory footprint, but it's not so good when you've got a HPC workload. Uh, Linux natively has a NUMA auto balance facility in it as well since about 3.8. Um, that's interesting because LiveVirt and KVM actually allow you to do some NUMA tuning as well. So there's some potential for some interesting interaction there, which we're doing some testing on at the moment. Um, huge Pages is another one. And um, EPT is a feature that CERN mentioned in their blog and then recently published some new information saying that when they had actually rolled out turning off EPT um, based on micro benchmark results, they realized that they had uh, a problem. 
<laughs> to say the least, because they're rolling out across a, a hypervisor fleet of about 160,000 cores, I think. Um, so that's our benchmarks at the moment. Uh, we're just using Linpack, and that is a micro benchmark, so there's a big caveat on that. But benchmarks are quite hard to do in the real world, right? Um, and that's something that maybe I think the scientific working group might be able to help with in terms of common codes and, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing to, to, I guess, know about is CPU capabilities. That provides a really big boost. If you're not passing through the host model of the CPU to the guest, then you're probably missing out on at least 10% performance. Um, and sometimes that means you need newer Q QMU KVM as well. For example, we were running on um, Trusty, but Trusty QMU KVM didn't know about Haswell yet, that sort of thing. Um, CPU pinning is another one that gets you another five plus percent. And NUMA memory allocation policy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this here. So here's some numbers that we got uh, running on Trusty. So this is a Trusty hypervisor running a CentOS 7 guest, because our, our HPC facility actually runs a CentOS OS at the moment. Um, on an, a Dell R630 two socket machine, two E5 2680 V3s. Um, so the bare metal performance up the top there, there's a couple of lines. We did the bare metal on both CentOS and Trusty, and you can see they're quite closely grouped. Um, then the lines very close together up there are various KVM performances, uh, very ca various KVM configurations rather. And so you get 97 to 98%, um, which is pretty good. Um, those 86% numbers there are num our uh, configurations where we have no pinning or anything like that. The only thing that's been done is passing the CPU host model through to the guest. One interesting thing to note on that graph is that one of the best numbers there was actually obtained just using NUMAD, not specifying any strict CPU topology or mapping into the guest. And that's quite neat because it means we didn't have to, we, you don't have to muck around too much with a m big set of flavors to get all these different configurations. You just let NUMA-D decide what to do. Um, and so we're now moving on to testing that in Xenial because we'll be upgrading there quite soon. Um, I didn't include any results there yet because we've encountered some interesting issues that look like bugs. <laughs> um, for one thing, NUMA-D is now packaged in Xenial, but Libvirt's not built with support for it. Um, uh, so the other major thing, I guess, for HPC is, uh, is network I.O. And uh, SROV, as I mentioned earlier with the way we integrated Lustre, solves that to a major extent. Um, and co-processors, co uh, co GPGPUs, that sort of thing, also SROV. Um, don't need to explain what single root IO virtualization is, hopefully, but um, it's there if you need to look it up. There's plenty of information out there. Um, just a final word on, on how we manage cluster deployment. So, you know, we, we're running a managed HPC uh, facility on the cloud. So this is not about giving users star cluster or something like this, because at least in my experience, we have maybe two people in our university that could go off and use that well for themselves. And even then, I'm not sure it's really the best use of their time. Um, we have a managed HPC facility with you know, software specialists that look after all of that stuff. So it's probably a, a, a more efficient thing to do there. Um, so the guys that actually run that HPC facility gave me some notes um, here. So they used heat initially for cluster deployment had had some rough edges with auto scaling and that sort of thing and also just frequent updates to the cluster at scale that might just be a maturity issue that we'll eventually see improves um, slurm is really happy running in this environment this, that's one of the problems with things like sge and why people are i guess maybe why slurm is becoming so popular now as well in this space uh, and of course images aren't a substitute for configuration management um, and global file systems are quite hard, obviously. Um, and the best ones, or the most performant ones, don't do encryption and then this sort of thing as well. So they want a strong relationship with their infrastructure as a service provider, which is us. And that was a quick tour of how we're doing HPC. <laughs>
And those are our partners. Uh, I guess questions? Yeah. Got any time left for questions? No. no? Well, if anybody's got a burning question, oh, well, I think take it outside. on the pipeline development to like make it match your system? Like what sort of feedback loop do you have there? Um, uh, so we have, I mean, the, the HPC team sits just across the hallway from us. So they work directly with users. They have, uh, I mean, they're very focused on engagement actually. Um, and so generally if there are any issues that may be infrastructure related, we hear about it pretty quickly. Um, but we typically don't need to get too involved in that stuff, no. Usually hear about patterns and things that we might need to support going forward. Yeah. yeah. So you essentially um, run all of your HPC workloads inside of your VM environment and only come out to InfiniBand to Luster um, via your um uh, back-end networking um, fabric? Yeah, so we're, well, actually, we're, we're actually not using InfiniBand, we're using Ethernet, so we use RDMA over Ethernet. Um, one of the kind of maybe interesting architectural decisions that we made there was not to build two separate fabrics for, for this environment um, and instead build single resilient fabric, so all hosts are, are bonded and so forth. Um, in in the cluster that we're just finalizing the build of at the moment, which is a new part of the massive environment, uh, that's 100 gig spectrum gear. And, you know, so we have um, multiple different speeds coming out of the guests and they can do MPI over, over that network as well as RDMA to Luster. Um, and we, we, I mean, we designed this thing so that our largest, say, MPI job is the size of a, a rack switch pair. Um, because we don't, I mean, that's already about um, well over 1,100 cores or so, um, which is well big enough for our users, yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Just